Good evening and welcome everybody to episode two of the Islanders live on the Thames Festival Facebook page, website and YouTube. I just have been told just before we began that apparently Facebook is experiencing some problems this evening and some people has had their Facebook stream during a live cut uh, earlier. If that happened tonight, I want you to know that we are also streaming live on the YouTube page of the Islanders. And in any way, we are recording the whole session. Fingers crossed it won't affect us or Facebook might have already solved that. But if for any reason this stopped suddenly, uh, be sure that we are recording the whole of the show and we would be then uploading it, uploading it later so that you can uh, listen to the full conversation with the uh, stars of this evening. If episode two was a big conversation on people's memories uh, in North Wellington, Silvertown, today we are focusing on a bit more on the history of the rail dogs, the ports and the ships and their maritime heritage. Uh, housekeeping, uh, another housekeeping keeping a message before we began. Last weekend, I was very, very, very badly stunned by a bee on my right hand. And that's the hand that I normally use to produce the show and click on all of the buttons to make the photos and the comments appear. I have lost a bit of mobility on my right hand. So things might take a bit more of time today. I might have to go a bit slower today, but we're gonna pay a big tribute to the spirit to the spirit of the Eastern will keep calm and carry on and show must go on. And talking about the show, let me introduce you now to the stars of today's show. Uh, we have Peter Stone, who is a member of the Docklands History Group Committee and the author of The History of the Court of London, a book that I can't stop recommending you all because it has sort of become my Bible for anything, everything uh, Court of London related. That's um, Peter's uh, book. Peter, good evening and thank you very much for being with us tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> We've got Stephen Pusey. Um, uh, I have to apologize. I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Once I unmute you, please uh, feel free to uh, correct me. Uh, Stephen, I met him through the Newham History Society. And I think he's a bit of a rock star in the history um, uh, scene because I'm just gonna show you just an example of a couple of messages that we received on Facebook when we announced that Stephen was going to be one of the speakers today. He said, wow, I would come to that one. He's fabulous. Good shout. Kate says, me too. Robert says, what Stephen does not know is not worth knowing. Definitely will be tuning in for that. So I hope you are all tuning in tonight to listen to what Stephen can tell us about the history of the dogs. Stephen, what is the message for your fans? Hi, <laughs> it's it's a real privilege to be invited. It's 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 um, a marvelous, and I'm I'm so glad that uh, history is really thriving in the Docklands as a new community emerges. It's just a marvelous thing to see, and there's just so much history, so much heritage, so much in that story of the human landscape of the docks. It's just really so fascinating. And so many people still living in the area, still connected to that history. Thank you very much. And thank you for being with us this evening. And we also have with us tonight, Asif, whom I have had the big pleasure of interviewing in the past for other events. And I'm really, really happy that Asif is joining us this evening. Asif is an independent researcher of, of maritime heritage, and his research is based on giving a voice and discovering uh, hidden stories of BAME seafarers. Asif, thank you very much and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And of course, the other big protagonist of this evening is 
all of you. So please, please, please join in this evening and participate with your comments, your questions. You can ask any question to any of the speakers this evening. I promise I will read all of your questions before the end of the show. Or we're going to be sharing and showing a lot of history photos of the royal dogs. If you have memories, knowledge, any details that you can add to the conversation about the photos that we will be showing or the history of the dogs, please participate with your comments. We will read while make I'll do my best to read all of your comments this evening or just um, comment to say hello and from where are you watching us this evening or what is your connection with Niwam or with the Royal Dogs and the big question do I have as always a music video to start the show yes to warm up I've got a music video with some of the photos that we will be looking at this evening and other photos of the Royal Dogs past and present enjoy party started history party tonight and this is our first photo there um well an illustration more than a photo uh, showing the construction of the royal victoria dog uh, shown on the illustrated london news september 1854 called courtesy of newham archives so my first question perhaps more for Peter, perhaps for Stephen, um, if I could travel back in time and I could see the land where the Royal Dogs, Royal Victoria Dog first was built just before the construction of the dogs, what would I see? What was in the area that we know we now know as Silvertown and North Woolwich before uh, the dogs were built? Well, really the whole of the... Um along the Thames there, uh, let's say east of Limehouse and that kind of area, was really just marshes. Um, so that, that included the, the what is the, that included the Isle of Dogs, for example, and the, um, along Silvertown and, and so on. Um, and if you look at old maps, um, the um, it tended to be the, the area which is now Silvertown or, or around there is is called um, uh, Plasto Level or, or ha um, East Ham Level. Um, and those those are the marshes. So it's really uninhabited, pretty much uninhabited, the whole of the area. Um, and um, and then 
um, I know I know Stephen is is very interested in in someone called uh, George Parker Bidder, and so um, let me let me bring him into the story at this stage. So so you have these these uninhabited marshes, um, and this character George Parker Bidder. He I mean we could do a whole show about him. Um, he's a um, he was a, a mathematical genius, a, a child prodigy, um, who could uh, calculate uh, very complicated mathematical um, uh, um, lots of numbers in his head, um, and um, so um, and that became very useful to him um, during his life. Um, and then he, as a, as a young man, he met up with um, uh, Robert Stevenson, the, um, uh, the the railway engineer. And um, and they formed a working partnership between them, and um, and that became very useful to Stevenson and other railway companies. That so this is the time in the around the eighteen forties when when railways were first starting to to be developed, and, and you get into railway mania, and um, so Stevenson and Bidder together were were building these railways, and um, and and uh, Stevenson would use him, and railway companies would use. Bidder, both to do calculations to to work out the cost of building their railways, um, but also um, to prevent other railway companies building there. So, so for example, if there's a parliamentary inquiry about a new railway, they would take Bidder along to this this inquiry and um, say, well, you know, do all, all all these figures add up? And very quickly he would say, no, it doesn't make sense. That no, don't don't build that railway. Um, so that's that's what he was doing. And one of his one of the projects that uh, Bidder and and um, Stevens had worked on was the Blackwall Railway, um, which went from um, uh, uh, London to the East India Docks, and uh, so through that, um, Bidder would have got to know the area, uh, the East End and, and and the docks and so on, um, the existing docks, the the West India Docks, the East India Docks, and so on, um, and um, then he decided to to create a new railway line. Um, across the, the plaster levels, um, which was uh, linking from the East County lines at Stratford uh, to the Thames down at Woolwich, which kind of to a lot of people didn't make any sense because you were going to a there somewhere that, yeah, you're going to nowhere. It's a railway <laughs> to nowhere, actually. But the the reason for it really was that um, there's a cross on the other side of the river was Woolwich. And um, so really what he was doing was making a railway to the north bank of the Thames. Um, and uh, so, and then uh, having built that railway, then there were uh, a couple of steam ferries that took people across backwards and forwards between Woolwich and this, uh, the end of his line, um, and uh, to, to take people so they could then get from Woolwich into London uh, via his railway. And he named the, the terminus of his, his, uh, his line at North Woolwich. Um, and um, so, but that, that was fine for a couple of years. Um, but then another railway company built a, a line directly from Woolwich along the south side of the Thames into London. And so that so now people could go directly into London without the, the bother of going on the on the ferry. So there was he was back to a situation where there was a line, but no passengers. Uh, so he needed to find they needed to find other uses for for the railway and attract um, attract business for, for the railway so um, so a way to do that one of the ways to do that was to uh, uh, would to get attract companies to uh, um, to uh, to around the around the area of North Woolwich and one of the first companies that moved there was um, SW Silver um, and um, so they moved there and the area where Silver the company built their factory became known as Silvertown um, so yeah, so and then other companies started to follow. Um, now, the the other thing that Bidder was was doing was um, he was getting involved in in telegraph as well, um, because telegraph was was a new invention and it was very important to the railway companies because uh, the railway companies needed to be able to communicate along their railway lines um, to, um, to 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 let everyone to let stations know where the trains were were at any one time um, so he invested in in the uh, something called the um, and it's called the English Telegraph yeah the electric telegraph company that's right mm -hmm. and um, and other investors in that were uh, were other railway engineers in particular two guys called Samuel Morton Petto and Thomas Brassey and we'll come back to them because they're very important when we get to the talking about the Royal Dogs um, so um, yeah, so um, 
w one of the things that um, that Bidder would have realised um, was that um, the the whole method of shipping was was changing. Um, the um, so another one thing that was new with with, with ships was that um, they were now getting bigger because because iron hulls have been invented um and so the old docks the um uh, like the west indias the london docks the um uh, the east india docks were all built upriver uh, for s relatively small sailing ships wooden sailing ships but now at this time uh when bidder was building his railway line and so on um the uh, ships are getting big uh with iron hulls um steam driven um and they could no longer that the Thames wasn't deep enough for those big ships to get up to the old docks. Um, so he and uh, Petto and uh, and the other the other guys uh, got together to to create um, a new dock, um, and at uh, where his railway line went to, more or less where his railway line went to, um, at uh, Plasto. And um, uh, so you know, like that movie when they say. You have a dream, build it, and they will come. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, so, um, oh, by the way, some of these, these I, I should mention that some of these big iron, iron ships, of course, were being built at uh, very close to there at, mm -hmm. uh, at the Thames Ironworks at, oh, uh, uh, at Bow Creek. Um, so, uh, yeah, so they're, they're building this uh, this new um, this new dock, and the, the, one of the, the, so there were several advantages of this 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 dock. First of all. Um, it was down river of, of the old docks and, and the Thames was deeper uh, there so um, the ships could actually breach it um, and um, secondly that uh, it was an uninhabited area uh, of marshlands very cheap to buy the land mm -hmm. uh, the uh, also um, it was cheap to to um, uh, to build as well because um, you, you know they weren't having to go down into a rock or anything like that. We're just going going down into marshland, so that was that was made it cheap to build as well. Um, and the other thing was that um, railway. This is the time of railways, of course, railway mania. The, the country was being linked with 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 um, railway lines, and and all these railway lines were taking goods around the country. Um, but the old docks were now in urban areas in Wapping and uh, and, and those places where you couldn't bring you couldn't make new railway sidings beside the docks because um, there was no space left um, whereas in this open area of marshes there was all the space in the world to to, to build railway sidings uh, which allowed the uh, any goods that were being uh, coming in or going out to be transshipped between the, the the trains and the um uh and, and the ship so so this was all perfect so um, we have the first system of docks or in when they first opened Royal Victoria, the first dock in London with the possibility of having a direct link from the dock to their railway system. Yes, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the railway lines could go to the other the other uh, docks, but not big railway sidings as you you had um, uh, you had. And of course, as we now know, the uh, they 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 uh, the, the dock was opened by uh, Prince Albert in 1855 and was called the Victoria Dock. And I'm going to unmute Stephen. I have, um, <laughs> I'm not mistreating him, but we have a, 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 an audio problem. If I talk at the same time that Stephen is not muted, we have a bit of um, a sound. So I have to be when Stephen talks and the other way around. But I'm going to now unmute Stephen because I could see that he was like nodding, um, uh, agreeing with everything that Peter was uh, tell, telling us. So uh, Stephen, what would you like to add to what uh, Peter was telling us about how and why and when and where the Victoria Dock open. Well, yeah, thank you. I think the first thing is that um, marshland is not empty land. It was it was used. Um, it was used for summer grazing for cattle and for um, fattening up cattle, horse grazing. Uh, whether you believe the myth or not, Dick Turpin was supposed to have done some of his first cattle rustling and horse stealing down on the Plasto Marsh. It may or may not be true. So there was summer grazing going on, a lot of wild fowling, hunt, duck hunting, that sort of thing. The the osier beds, that's to say growing young willow, uh, willow saplings was very profitable on the marshes. So when Beckton Gasworks opened, uh, s uh, several osier bed growers sued the Beckton, uh, the, uh, the gas light and coke company for loss of income. 
And there was also a lot of prize fighting going on. Um, people, uh, boxers come, used to come out of London uh, to, for illegal prize fights on the marshes. So it was not the case that there was nothing going on there. And there was, of course, already a ferry uh, from the Newham's, what became the Newham side across to the other, um, to the other side. Uh, as early as 1812, 1813, a ferry had opened at the bottom of what became Prince Regent Lane. Prince Regent Lane was built to serve that ferry and named after the Prince Regent at the time. I think the other thing to to make and to, to point out, to point out as Peter's already pointed out, what you've got with the creation of the docks is this coming together of a number of different technologies. So you've got, as he said, rail transport, steamships, telegraph. You've also got refrigeration. So you can bring meat across from Australia and New Zealand and Canada um, in steamships to the docks. You've also, and you've got the cheap land, of course, and you've got the, and also free trade was a brand new idea at that time. The Corn Laws had only um, just been repealed. And um, so you, you began to get enormous amounts of cheap wheat coming from North America, cheap meat coming from Australia and New Zealand. And that had a profound effect on farmers and farm workers in England for, uh, because for them, um, growing of crops and raising of animals was no longer profitable. So thousands and thousands of farm workers streamed off the land from the 1850s onwards into the big cities like London and were a big pool of cheap labour that was available. So you had cheap land, cheap um, cheap labour, and you also had cheap goods coming in, access to new materials from all around the, from all around the world, thanks to British imperialism, which was going out and creating colonies and uh, exporting from those colonies back to Britain all the raw materials that those colonies were providing. So you do get this kind of interesting coming together of of, um, of technologies and available labour, cheap land and uh, raw materials. Sorry, I think I think I was muted. I was talking. I didn't realize I was muted. Um, I was saying that I, we could now see a photo of the Royal Albert Dog, the second of the Royal Dogs to open. Uh, this photo was taken in 1914. The Royal Albert Dog was open uh, earlier than that. And I've got a question. Uh, I'm just curious about something because I have read two different theories about the the construction of the Albert Dock. And if we look at this photo, we can see the whole stretch of water from one end of the Albert Dock. This photo is taken by uh, where the University of East London now is. Uh, the water going all the way down to Royal Victoria Dock. It, there's really no separation between the two of them. It looks like just a huge dock. And I have read two different theories that it was supposed to be a dock in itself, or it was supposed to be just an extension of the Royal Victoria. Um, Stephen, Peter, can you clarify this? Well, the, the thing is that, again, the um, uh, can, ships continue to get bigger. Um, so uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the there's the dock company that built the, the, um, the, the, the Victoria Dock, and then uh, they, in, a, in 1864, were acquired by the the, Lon the um, London and St Catherine Dock Company, which owned the St Catherine's Docks and the the London Docks um, further up river. Um, but ships were were still continuing to get bigger, um, and um, and that was particularly so after 1869, because in that year the the Suez Canal opened, and uh, so it was possible for for um, uh, it, that uh, made trade between uh, the between England and the Far East much um, much more profitable because ships could go backwards and forwards 
much quicker than they could in the past. So ships were more trade, ships were getting bigger. Um, and so it got to a point where the um, the Victoria Dock was was now uh, itself becoming a bit small for these these new big ships. Um, so uh, a, a bigger, deeper lock, a, dip dock, a bigger, deep dock was required. Um, and so the, um, uh, the the new dock, the, the the Royal Albert, was was sort of a deeper dock with b bigger lock uh, locks to get into it and so on. So I suspect that it was probably planned as a set to answer your question i think it was pretty planned as a separate dock from the beginning because it was a a different size in effect it was a deeper deeper dock than the uh the old um victoria dock and i can you again uh, well I, that's a great that's a perfect summary from peter but just to say that once the once again from the human aspect once the royal, the albert dock had been completed it cemented that role of the royal docks as the sort of the gateway to the empire as it were you know that was really the place it was really began to be seen as the place where all the ships went out to all four corners of the earth and came back again and also the human cargo that was going out and coming back settlers colonial administrators soldiers um the, you know vast sort of numbers of people leaving britain and going out to 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 live in what were then the colonies and vast numbers of people coming in of course settling traders workers um shipmen dockers ship workers people working on board and and uh, people working in the docks you know so there was this uh, enormous amount of humanity moving backwards and forwards through those two docks as well uh the next photo is not from the archives it's actually from my phone and it's because just i'm again uh you may not have the answer although i couldn't believe you had you didn't have it because um i've been told that between the both of you, you know everything that there is to know about the Royal Dogs. And as safe, get ready because I've got a question for you right after this photo as well. Uh, so this is from my phone and is uh, a couple of photos from the sides and a photo of the what I believe is the pumping pumping station in the Royal Albert Dog. And I love the building. I take a lot of photos of the building every time I go for a walk about the Royal Albert Dock, but I have to confess that other than knowing that it's called the Pumpkin, Pumpkin Station, I have no idea what it is or, yeah, yeah, I have no idea what is this building. Well, there are a lot of, there are a lot of um, pumping stations around the whole of the, uh, as Peter said right at the beginning, it's Plasto Marsh, East Ham Marsh. So those pumping stations are absolutely vital to keep the to keep the the water off the land. The other thing, of course, is that to save money, those docks were not built entirely sunk into the ground. They were built. Uh, if you looked at, if you saw the original image of the vast steel girders. That, those are part of the embankments for the for the building of the docks, because that's it. That's the one. So the docks are they're actually above the level of the, the the water level in the dock is above the level of the land. The land is so low lying and so below sea level in most of Plasto Marsh and East Ham Marsh that um, any overflowing of the docks would be would be pretty disastrous, as we found out. Uh, or overflowing of the river, as we found out in the floods of 1953. So, yes, there are a lot of pumping stations in the, around around um, Beckton and um, the Royal Docks. In fact, when they were re when they began the redevelopment of London Docklands, I remember uh, the LDDC had the first thing that had to happen was for Newham Council to build a new network of even bigger pumping stations um, to service to keep the water out of the basements or the underneath of the new houses that were planned. The other thing, of course, as well as pumping stations, you have the sewage pumping stations because um, our end of the ri river is the end of the great, is the northern outfall sewer, which was built by Basil Jet in the 1850s, 1860s. So there are also pumping stations to keep the sewage pumping along out into the river. 
Yeah, the thing, the thing to remember as, as well is that any dock, um, the water level has to be maintained at exactly the same level all the time. It's like a canal, really. Um, mm -hmm. And um, when you consider that uh, at, at the end of the, the, the dock, you've got um, a lock, uh, which is bringing... Um, so the ship's coming in, in and out through the dock, and and so water is going in and out through that uh, through that lock. Um, and if you imagine a, a ship that's tied up, um, you know, it, it, even just a few inches can make a huge difference um, in the water level to to you know all the ropes and chains and so on of, of that ship. It has to be maintained exactly to the same level all the time. So that's mm -hmm. another you know reason for the pumping stations to maintain the water level within the dock itself. Thank you very much. There's, there's a, I don't, I don't know that particular um, building you you took a photo of. Is that in, at the Royal Docks? Yeah. So this is at the okay. end of um, Royal Albert Dock in, a, okay. in an area that is now called Royal Wharf, and okay. I, I can see it was built 1912. And I knew it was called the pumping station, yeah. uh, but I wasn't very sure you know, what was the what you know what was the building for and and indeed if it was still operating or whether it, we just have the building there because it's a listed building yeah yeah i haven't been inside that one but um, there's another one which is at the um the, the western end of the um west india docks the uh, you know just by canary wharf uh, hmm. where the, the 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 dock sort of uh, butts up against the the river and uh, i've been inside that one it's fascinating inside huge huge pumps inside there um and it's sometimes open um for the public to go inside and it's, it's it's fascinating to go inside if you can get there and just as i used this show tonight to ask a couple of questions that i was personally curious about to stephen and peter let me remind everybody if you're watching live please 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 do send any question that you would like to ask to any of our speakers tonight about the history of the Royal Dogs, because as Robert said, um, our friend Robert said on Facebook, if they don't know, what, what they don't know is not worth knowing. So anything you want to know about the history of the dogs, uh, Royal Dogs, or the history of the dogs in general, because we have here Peter, uh, the author of the history of the Port of London, Tonight is your chance to ask any question about the maritime heritage of the Thames and the London Docks. And very, very close to where I took this picture in the Royal Albert Wharf, one can also find a street called Lascars Avenue. And I was really, really, really um, honoured to have uh, Asif with us tonight because Asif could clarify, first of all, what does Lascars mean? Why do we have a street in Royal Docks called Lascars Avenue? And he might be also very happy to talk about who is this other gentleman in this photo. Uh, that's, that's right, Maria. Um, I think Lascars is two ways of approaching the word. It could be seen as derogatory, uh, whereas if it's used in the Urdu language or the Hindi language, it's not actually derogatory as such. Um, Lashkar actually comes from the word Lashkar. Lashkar was a Persian word which made its way into the Urdu language and the Hindi language. Um, it was a word that origi originally from that came originally from Arabic, meaning from Askir, meaning soldier or army. So uh, Lashkar actually meant army or camp. It never meant sailor as such in the literal sense, but it was applied for the sailors that came from the, the, the British Empire. And I like something that Stephen was mentioning about the muscles of the empire and how colonial guests arrived in, uh, in, in, in the docks, at the, at the docks. Um, and, sorry, and, la and that's why uh, we find that, uh, you know, there's a road named Lascars Avenue. It was actually Lashkar Avenue. But, um, so that's by, just by the Royal Albert Dock. And with regards to the picture Maria mentioned about the gentleman on the right, that's actually my grandfather, and his name was Mohammed Gama. And he actually arrived at the docks, at the Royal Victoria Docks, sorry in 1917. He stayed there for a month during the First World War and he arrived on the SS Kiva, which is a vessel of the PNO. And this vessel remained at the docks for a month or so until January 1918 for refitting. And the vessel was refitted for the purpose of going to the United States, to New York, to transport American troops back to London uh, during, the, during the First World War. And um, it's interesting to find out uh, that my grandfather arrived there and stayed there for a month is also, he probably came a lot earlier in 1913 as well, but I've not actually managed to find 
a precise record to pinpoint him at arriving at the Royal Victoria Dock. And Asif, do you feel that history books do not reflect, do not talk enough about the big contribution of BAME seafarers to the history and the maritime uh, heritage of the Royal Docks and the, and the Docks of London in general? I think that's quite true, actually. Um, to, um, it's, it's quite a sad thing that in our time, um, not much is known about the BME seafarers that came off at the Royal Victoria and the Royal Albert Docks in Newham. Um, I mean, there, are, there is some, 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 something, but it, I just like to mention here, you know, I've got the graphic here for dated the 6th of August, 1892. And I'll just read out these few, few lines. I won't read out the entire paragraph. It's quite long. Um, it says in here, is estimated, therefore, that fully 2,000 sailors, dockers, and firemen professing the creed of Muhammad have been in the docks during the past week or 10 days, and their rites and celebrations in honor of the period have, in consequence, possessed all added enthusiasm of big numbers to take part in them. And this was for the period of 6th of August 1892. So imagine from 10 days before this, or tended around this period, there was roughly 2,000 or so Indian seafarers present at the Royal Victoria Dock staying there. And I, I, you could never imagine this or think about it in, in the present day. But so many seafarers came there, roughly from something like 1870s onwards, and you find thousands of seafarers have arrived there. Um, a, large, a large percentage died as well, and they were buried at you know, West Ham Cemetery uh, in unmarked public graves. And there's nothing even a, a, a plaque to, to on these graves to mark that there's a seafarer who arrived in 18, you know, 1870 or 1880s and was buried here. So it's, it's an interesting subject. And, that, and that's why we are very, very, very grateful uh, that you are here tonight, Asif. So those stories, we're giving a voice and we are giving a place to those stories that are also part of the history of the royal dogs. Now, looking at this, photo, uh, Royal Docks, uh, about 1935. This is now when we can, we can talk about this area as the Royal Docks, as we know them, the Royal Victoria, the Royal Albert and King George the Fifth Dock. When the opening of, um, with the opening of King George the Fifth Dock uh, in 1921, so a hundred years ago this year, the Royals were completed. And they truly were the heart of the Port of London. So um, to the three of you a bit, what can you tell me about how the three of the docks operated, the ships and shipping companies operating in these docks, uh, the cargo coming? How, how, how big were really the royal docks in comparison with the ports in all, on, all around the world? Were they really the biggest, busiest, uh, biggest and busiest system of enclosed Dogs in the world. Um, well, yes, very much so. I mean, it's it's the biggest area of, of water, enclosed area in, in the world uh, during its time. So, uh, uh, in terms of size, it was it was enormous um, compared with anything else. Um, and uh, you know that you know it was uh, by the, the end of the uh, the nineteenth century, early. 20th century uh, by the time that King George V was built you know Britain had this vast empire um, and the, the the royal docks had trading links not only with the the, the empire but you know in, in lots of other countries as well you know meat coming in from Argentina and uh, and places like that so um, it was um, yeah, it was a vast I mean I, um, I, I, I made a note that for example in the in the early 1960s which is an equivalent period in terms of amount of trade there were a thousand ships coming in a week into the docks. thousand ships yeah not not into the royal docks in in uh just in the royal docks but in in into the port of london there are a thousand ships a week coming in so um and, and the royal docks was you know the biggest of the the group of docks so you know so a, a large percentage of that thousand a week would, would be coming into the the royal docks so it was it was it was an enormous amount of trade coming in and out uh uh do any of you have off the top of your head the figure of how much water, how big, how many acres of water did the uh, the Royal Docks um, extend to? <laughs> not off the top of my head. If I if I looked at my book, it would say in there, but not off the top of my head, I can't remember. It was, it was I, think, 
It brings up, I, I, I shouldn't have asked the question without having the answer, because I actually have the answer in one of the, one of the books. Um, I think it's 250 acres, does it sound like correct? Could be. Oh, um, Could be. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Stephen, I'm going to mute myself so I can unmute Stephen. Uh, I want Stephen to describe me a bit. One day, uh, how many people would I see come in, live in? Uh, from which countries to what to which countries? Which sort of cargo would we see? How many people working in the area? Imagine I don't know anything about the dogs, and I want to imagine one day in the Royal Dogs in let's say something like 1950s. What, what describe the scene? The scene for me. Bustling, <laughs> bustling. It it was just the most incredible. Um, a warehouse of empire you might call it so stuff was as peter said already is stuff was coming in from all over the world and this is long before containerization so cinnamon sticks came in big long barrels oil came in wooden drums before it came came in metal barrels um you know oranges and lemons were in special crates lined with rubber so they didn't leak now one of the things about the Dock railway system was that where the orange and where the citrus sheds were, they had to have special rubberized tracks because the citrus would leak out of the bottom of the hoppers of the of the train wagons onto the tracks, and there was so much citrus leaking out, even though it was sealed, that this the tracks were being eaten away by the citrus. All these little details. When you imagine the thousands of clerks beaving away, every single ship arriving had to go into a ledger what it was carrying, the weight, you know, how long it took to unload it, who'd been assigned to unload it. Think of all those stevedores unloading stuff safely, loading stuff back on safely so that the ship could depart. You know, Think of all the tugboatmen, you know, all, the, um, all the dockside workers, the crane drivers. Think of all the, the dinner ladies, the tea ladies, all those people working in the canteens. Um, <clears throat> this vast canteen that was in the, next to Royal Albert Dock. Think of all the train drivers. I'm very glad you mentioned the cranes. Uh, we have these beautiful photos of the cranes from Robert Rogers. Um, I mean, they're so big. I mean, that's what I like this video. You can see how tall they are in comparison to the buildings. Uh, did you have one person driving on each train? Yes. The skilled job. And, it, and, and it, where would they be? Would they be on the train? They were on the crane, and remember the safety of the men working below in the holds of the ships depended on the accuracy and skill of those crane drivers. So, you know, every, people's life, people depended for their lives and their safety on each other. So there's a terrific comradeship between the dock workers uh, that you rarely find in other communities around the country. Um, living was very hard. Working conditions were really tough. And living conditions and housing back where these people lived was tough as well. So, uh, you know, there, it's not surprising there were frequent labour disputes because uh, the dock bosses were ready to get away with whatever they could in terms of health, what we now call health and safety. So, um, you know, it's it's a it's a there are to come back on what as Steve said. I think one of the interesting things about the Royal Docks is that compared with say Tiger Bay in Wales or the Liverpool docks or the Glasgow docks, the history of the BAME, BAME community in the Royal Docks has really been disgracefully neglected. It's just a missing piece of the story. It's not been well researched. It's not been well documented. I don't know if Asif would agree with me there, but it's, it's a lot more work doing on it to see just the impact that um, these people arriving and the impact they had on the communities where a lot of them settled. What do you think, Asif? I've been looking at it myself and I realised that. Uh, and I've not... I, so, can you hear me? Um, I, I definitely agree with you on this, Stephen, because I've actually been looking at it myself and I've been looking at the history of the dogs and I've realised that not a lot survives with regards to colonial seafarers or, or South Asian seafarers that arrive at the docks. Um, you would find that even the, 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 the Seaman's Rest, for example, that were based on the Victoria Dock Road 
they've now all disappeared or they've become, been converted to flats and, um, and not a single sign survives to indicate. I mean, you might find the old, the old, the old foundation stone that survives in the building, but there's nothing to indicate that there was BME seafarers that would have come and stayed here at these premises. And some of the premises have disappeared, for example, like the Siemens Hospitals, for example. Uh, I know there was the, the first Siemens Hospital was a Connaught Road. That was, that, the building was, a sub, sub, was demolished due to subsidence. And then we find that the other building was off Annenwick Road, off uh, Prince Regent Lane. We find that was, again, converted to a nursing home. And you find um, uh, many BME seafarers, for example, come and stay there in 1899. And um, I, it's interesting because I was looking at the subject and, uh, earlier, and there was a book called Welcome Aboard by Jane Matthews. And it, it carries an, a beautiful sketch, which I quickly, if I can, I quickly show you here. Um, it carries a beautiful sketch of, uh, um, sorry, give me a second. It carries a beautiful, beautiful sketch of, um, if I could just hold this up, I know it doesn't sound really professional, but um, it carries a beautiful sketch of mm. BME seafarers at the Siemens Hospital. And this was pictured in 1899. So it's quite interesting to see, uh, you know, BME seafarers present at these, uh, at these various sites, such as, such as the docks and the Siemens Hospital. Uh, Peter, what do you think of what Stephen have said about the um, the lack of representation of BAME seafarers in the history of the Port of London, in as we know it in other books, other recollections? Yeah, well, I, I, in in terms of uh, regarding the, the Royal Docks, that's absolutely true. I, I, you know, even through all my research, I've not really come across much at all. Um, there is there is quite a bit of information around these days about the. Um, uh, uh, seafarers from uh, from um, the Indian subcontinent, um, with regard to um, the, um, the the East India docks, particularly, and, and, and those kind of docks. And uh, um, so, um, I, I, for example, I went to a very interesting talk a couple of years ago about um, the uh, the places where where the East India dock um, uh, sailors, the the the, the uh, so just just to sort of go back a bit. Uh, uh, so uh, we, you know, when we talk about Lascars, there, so really I think the we can say that the uh, the tradition of, of Lascars started with the East India Company uh, when you know back in the uh, 1600s, 1700s when they uh, were first started going backwards and forwards between uh, between London and and the the Far East. And and what would happen is that on the way out, um, a certain number of the crew. So the, going out, it would be English crew, uh, but so, some of those would die on the way out. That, that happened pretty much on every voyage. So they needed extra crew to bring the ship back. Um, and, and that's where the, the whole tradition of Lascar started. Um, and, and in those days, um, ships sail, tended to sail once a year because of the uh, because it took so long to get backwards and forwards. So so therefore, um, these um, sailors from from the Far East would have to stay in, in London over the, the winter months. Um, and so there were places which they called barracks. The East India Company set up barracks uh, for them to stay in not very nice conditions. Um, and, and there were, um, there were all these um, different traditions um, mixed together, you know, um, Chinese and Indian, for example, um, lots of disputes between them, um, lots of fighting going on because of different disputes. So it, it wasn't very pleasant. And uh, uh, th there is a certain amount of information about sort of those over in the East End, the, the in, in, around Shadwell and so on. But in terms of the Royal Docks, I know nothing at all. So, um, you know, it's very, very interesting for, for me to hear about, so, you know, the things that Asif is saying and, and uh, um, what, you know, we, you know, we definitely need to know more about what the uh, Lascars and the, um, uh, the Royal Docks, that's for sure. Well, as if you are a man on a mission to give a voice to those stories, I think you're getting really um, a lot of success. And I'm really, really happy that you are doing that with us this evening. I sort of put Stephen on the spot when I asked him to describe a day in the dogs. But actually, his beautiful description matches pretty much what we have seen in the different uh, photos that we have been uh, collecting collating and uh, recollecting for today, for example, um, he was talking about how much cargo and how far the ships were going to. And for example, we can see this photo of inside one of the transit warehouses in uh, King George the Fifth. And all of these boxes, all of these crates here were traveling from London 
all the way to Adelaide in Australia. We also have this beautiful picture of Kevin Wybert. I think the photo was actually taken after the closure of the docks, but it does give you an idea of how big the ships that uh, visited the Royal Docks were, how, uh, how easy it was for the Royal Docks to accommodate big ships that could not fit in other docks upstream uh, the River Thames in other parts of London. We have seen how huge, how tall the cranes were. I know some of you in the community who might be watching the show tonight either drove or knew people who worked in the docks driving the cranes or loading and loading the ships or were ladies working in the offices in the canteens uh some of your relatives uh, were part of the storytelling that Stephen was sharing with us when I asked him to describe a day in the royal dog so if you're watching this evening please 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 send your questions, send your comments, let me know what's your connection with the Royal Docks. Did you work in one, in one of those ships, shipping companies, in the warehouses, in the cranes? Do you have family or friends who worked in the factories surrounding the docks? Uh, do you remember some of the last cars, people from other countries coming to work in their docks? Do you remember meeting them? So do send your questions, your comments, your memories, because I would like to hear less from me and more from you this evening. Um, uh, we got another photo, and I'm gonna show you a bit like a present and 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 past. Uh, this photo is from. Uh, thank you very much to Kevin Hale and Andrew Christie, showing more or less how this building looks like today. And we've got another photo from New York Archives showing how the Royal. Albert Duck manager's office looked like uh, some time ago. And I've got my first question is can anybody clarify really the name of this building? Because I think I have seen this building being called the manager's, the dock manager office, the Royal Albert Duck manager's office. I have seen this building being referred to as central offices at Custom House. And I have also seen this building being called the central buffet. And I don't know whether that's a very posh name for an office or was this a restaurant for dockers? Um, please, um, Stephen, put me out of my misery. The central buffet was a completely different building. Um, um, this, this, it's the dock, it was known as the dock manager's office. That was my misery. <laughs> uh, that, that's what I've always heard it called, and that's what it's always referred to. It was built in 1883, and it was uh, designed by a company called Vigas and Wagstaff. <clears throat> they designed it on the, in the style of Norman Shaw, who was a terrifically uh, fashionable sort of uh, late Victorian, early Edwardian. <clears throat> um, what should we say? Uh, he liked his he liked his Gothic twirls. He liked his tall chimneys. It, it, he liked his industrial buildings to look slightly country house, which I think you'll agree it does. 1883. It, it does, it, it is. And it actually, yeah, it does look like a manor house that you would find in the middle of the countryside in England. Yeah. And, and, what was, and tell me about what happened inside the building, who worked in the building, who would come into this building? Well, it, it was the central administrative building for the Royal Albert Dock. So it was where all the central records were kept. It was where all the, all the key staff worked, all the senior staff worked. And they could also keep a very good eye. They had a very good view. It was right on the waterfront. So they had a very good view of what was happening in the Royal, Dock, in the Royal Albert Dock itself. So, uh, yeah, what, whatever went on there was what was the decisions of the, that the senior management team were making about what was happening or to happen to the Royal Docks. And it does look very similar to, um, I'm, I'm now a bit sorry I don't have a photo to show for comparison, but it does look very similar to the Galleon Hotel at the, at the, at the edge of the Royal Albert Dock. A time, uh, built at a similar time. But of course the Galleons Hotel was the other terminus of the railway that ran down into Docklands. And that was the passenger departure point rather than industrial uh, uh, cargo departure point. So the passengers would stay their last night in, 
in the Galleons Hotel before leaving for India uh, and other parts of the empire. So lots of famous people stayed uh, in Galleons Hotel and it was mentioned in by Kipling uh, in one of his books as a reference point for um, the last the last place you'll stay in before you leave England. And I was, I was um, let me do this. I was uh, mistaken uh, the central offices manager the dock manager's office building that we were talking about this building I was confusing it with the central buffet so since i have you here steven what was then the central buffet where where is the central buffet building uh in comparison to this i mean if you could help us locate it in our in our map in the map in our in our minds and was the central buffet like a canteen uh buffet like a restaurant for either dockers or passengers let me unmute you because um it was a it, it was a buffet that's exactly it was a restaurant a cafe for um mostly for the office workers in the docks unless somebody uh, who's watching this now can can tell me different i'm pretty sure it was for the office work it was a very very large building because they had a very large number of everything was recorded by hand in ledgers as i said and all the calculation all the mathematical calculations of tonnages and profit and loss were all done by hand so they had enormous numbers of clerks um working in those places and they all needed feeding <laughs> so if you if you're watching this show tonight you need either go to the buffet or know the buffet building or know the central offices or you used to go to the central offices when you were working at the docks or you know anybody who did uh do share your own memories about the places and the stories that we are discussing this evening next photo and it's something that uh uh Stephen had already introduced, uh, we can see cases of New Zealand apples being unloaded at the Royal Docks 1949. And with this photo, the first thing that came to mind was I wanted to ask Stephen and Peter uh, about the working conditions of the dockers, the people who worked at the docks loading and unloading the ships, the, the, the crates, the boxes. Because I don't think this was an... Uh, you, you, you'll correct me if I'm mistaken. I don't think this was like a nine to five job that you had a contract uh, for a month or for a year. I think there was something about you had to go to the the, um, the gates of the dogs and being lucky um, and hope that you would be picked up for work. How how did how did things work? Let Peter let Peter describe this. If you unmute, Peter. Sorry. Um, yeah, so um, I was saying that uh, uh, things change over time, but, but generally speaking, there are different grades of, of dockers. And uh, um, so uh, you would have the, the sort of the, the higher level dockers, who were the, the, the permanent staff, the perms, as they were called. Um, and then, as you say, the, um, the, the, the manual labor uh, would have to sort of go along to the docks every day in the morning and and uh, uh, and hope they got picked to 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 have some work. Um, that that changed over over time. So that's a, I'm, I'm generalising here. Um, and then, um, but the the, the the very sort of highest level were the um, Stephen has sort of in, used the word earlier stevedores, and they were the sort of the 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 the, the top level uh, because they were the guys that were really skilled and and had to decide. Um, how to load a ship and how to unload a ship so that the, the ship didn't fall over uh, uh, while it was out at sea. Uh, and, and also, of course, you know, a ship goes from port to port to port. So therefore, um, you have to load the ship uh, in a way that each uh, piece of cargo can be unloaded uh, in the right order at the, the various ports it's, it's uh, um, arriving at. So those, those are kind of different levels of dockers. Um, I think you know what's interesting about that particular photo as well is you can see that uh, you know the, the the goods were arriving in individual boxes, um, and uh, so you know the um, uh, and uh, so you know uh, what would happen is that the, the, you mentioned earlier about the cranes and the the crane driver would have to sort of uh, lower a sort of a, um, a sort of a, the crane into the uh, into the hold of the ship, and then all those boxes have to be Put onto the uh, uh, whatever it was called, the sort of the um, 
not pallet, but you know whatever it was that, that was, they called it to to lift up all those individual boxes. And I, I'm sure there were plenty of accidents that happened uh, over time and lots of injuries. Um, and it was very uh, very manual labour, very time consuming to to load or unload a ship. It would take several days uh, in the days before containerization. Uh, Stephen, you're not. Yeah. Yes, I mean, it, it's, you know, that's exactly as Peter said. Of course, it's not a coincidence that um, this very hard working conditions are, is, is linked to the fact that trade union activity, labor activity, and um, political. Uh, political activity gr grew in the docks. You know, this the, it's one of the birthplaces of the labour movement. It's the birthplace of trade union activity. The Great Docker Strike of 1888. The Gas Workers Union was founded in Beckton at Beckton Gas Works next to the docks. Uh, you know, it's it's those hard conditions led directly to um, to action to improve people's conditions. And I, I, we've been talking really so far about men. You know the men who worked in the dock. Let's not forget the lives of the women back home. You know they they endured very very tough living conditions as well. They were expected to feed families, to raise families. You to... have become my best friend now, Stephen. So you have become my best friend now. <laughs> no, but it, it's absolutely true. You know that whatever the men had to suffer, the tough conditions, the women were facing. Uh, you know on the home front. This terrific, terrific deprivation, jerry-built housing, no mains drainage, uh, la uh, landlords who were greedy landlords. So they had to create their own sisterhoods, their own communities back in Canning Town, Plaster and across in Woolwich, those sort of places where, and so there were, those were places where the suffragettes movements grew up, you know, so that women would be represented. Uh, there were movements to have women represented on West Ham Council and East Ham Council and so on. So all those kinds of things, you know, were, were reflections of those tough working conditions that Peter's pointed out. We have now this photo of the Kono, Kono Tavern, I think it's pronounced Kono. If not, please, please do um, correct me after I sh have shown the, uh, the two photos about this building, uh, Peter or Stephen Oasid. The Kono Tavern, which now is called the Fox Kono, and this picture showing the building as more or less it is nowadays, is from David Conroy. And we also have this photo of the Kono Tavern from the Newham Archives. Um, and I don't know how much you know about this building. I do know something about this building that uh, I would love to share because I love ghost stories and I have been told that there used to be a ghost story in this building. So I'm going to tell you this, this story. This building is a grade two building, grade two listed building built in 1881. And it is said that this building, the Knotavern, has a ghost of a mad woman. She was the aunt, the aunt of the landlord who committed suicide in the late 19th century in a bedroom on the second floor. So she probably jumped from one of the windows that we can see in the photo. The story says that the room was abandoned after the death and over the years, the white sheets on the bed became gray with dirt and layers of dust covered the entire room. When a new landlord took over him and his staff decided to open the room, what they saw was the mad old woman, her eyes lit by the wild light of insanity and her mouth twisted into a leering, wicked shape. They all escaped downstairs to safety and the ghost has not been seen for years. So that's how much I know about the Cornell Tavern. Uh, I uh, think I have also read that it used to be, it was built, uh, the idea was that it would be like a fancy restaurant hotel for passengers traveling to or from the Royal Docks, but ended up, and that's why it's connected to this, what we were talking about, the, the dockers and how the docks, the dockers had to go and, and hope to be picked up for work for the day. I have also read that it was like a play. It ended up, it ended up being 
a, a place, a meeting point for dockers looking for work. That's where they, they met at the Cornwall Tavern. And again, I can see Stephen uh, nodding. Uh, so I think I got it right, but I'm going to unmute him because he'll be able to explain it much better than me. I think Peter probably knows more about the the Dockers meeting. It was it became the Dockers Tavern certainly, and the story of the ghost is pretty well known. But that is the spot um, next to the Connaught where the cobblestones were till recently, known as on the stones where the Dockers had to arrive looking for work. They had to crowd around the the gangmasters there, and the gangmasters would pick the the biggest and the strongest and the toughest. Um, for work for that day and if you weren't right at the front of the queue right at the front of the crowd you went home no work that day it was a day labor day job and it was very very tough uh, for most people because most people queuing up on the stones did not get work you know it was it was a matter of chance but as I say Peter probably knows more about that than I do Sorry. The, I think the name Jack Dash is the one that uh, most people would would um, recognise and uh, connect with. With uh, I, I know I, I I'm not such a great expert on that whole period, but uh, so I imagine that uh, uh, the the Dockers met around the Connaught Hotel today. Stephen, do you think um, the and Jack Dash held the you know the, the the big meetings of the Dockers, and there were lots of wildcat strikes and uh, and so on. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I can't really add a, a lot to it, I'm afraid, but, uh, um, you know, I know sort of vaguely that's, that's, that was what was happening. One for Asif, um, Asif, we were talking about how little we know about the BAME seafarers coming to the Royal Docks. Even Peter acknowledged that he hadn't found much about uh the bame bame seafarers in the royal looks in particular uh i would like you to tell us a bit more about the, the venues the facilities what was in place for them in the community where where did they go to where did they stay it's a it's a good question maria i think a lot of the bame seafarers that came on those ships of the pno or the british india steam navigation company they often tend to settle at you know Siemens rests or, or Siemens homes along Victoria Dock Road, or there's some in even in Greenwich, and um, they often they often uh, were destitute and needed work or, or during the time they stayed here, and they often were looking to board the next ship back to India or Africa. Um, you have to find that they were quite poor, and uh, a, a good read on this is uh, it is the Asiatic England in England, the Asiatic in England by Joseph Soller, who was a Christian missionary who documented various counts of uh, BME seafarers who were destitute and looking for work when they arrived in, in London. They were poor, they needed money for, 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 and, and a place to stay, and they needed food as well, so they were often begging on the streets of London. And you can find various accounts in various books. Uh, I think there's a book by Peter Akronoid on uh, Autobiography of London or something, and I think he mentions quite a few accounts in there as well. Thank you, Steve. I, I, I see a Stephen want to add. One of those pictures is uh, the one that was on the left was the Coloured Men's Institute, mm -hmm. which was founded by a, what is now Sri Lanka, a Ceylonese, Sri Lankan uh, pastor, Pastor Kamal Chunchi. And he was uh, an in, enormous influence in Canning Town and Docklands. Uh, he, <clears throat> he set it up with his own money and he funded... Um, uh, medicines for uh, <coughs> visiting seafarers who couldn't afford, afford it. Uh, <coughs> a lot of them um, <coughs> married local women. He, he held parties for uh, local children. Uh, he made sure that people had accommodation if they needed it. Uh, he was a, a, an incredible but almost forgotten influence uh, in, in that part of the world. And it's uh, uh, the late uh, historian Howard Block documented some of his life, but it, it still is not that well known. And it, it's a real shame because he was one of the absolute heroes who went into Docklands, uh, into the 
into all that poverty and all that all that jerry built housing and all that substandard social welfare and did something about it he made people's lives better Thank you, Stephen. I'm going to show again um, the photo of the Konota that we were talking about before. And we have a comment from David Bullard. He says, uh, what's exactly opposite the pub? Uh, and I think I, I, I would like to ask David if you meant that where the dockers um, used to gather when they were looking for work, when they were hoping to be picked up for work. Uh, did you mean that that's where they met, right opposite the pub? Uh, and thank you very much, uh, David, for joining us this evening. I'm very curious to know uh, what, what you meant with uh, your comment. It was exactly opposite the pub when we were talking about the Kurno Tavern. And I have to say thank you to Stephen, because I asked him earlier a very, very difficult question. I said to him, would you describe to me a day in the Royal Docks if we could travel back in time? And he described it perfectly in a lot of detail, the ships, the containers, the people working, the clerks, the, the crates, the, the, the bussing um, scene. And not only I enjoyed it and loved it, Suzanne also says, I'm really enjoying the history of the dogs as you are describing it. We also have a comment from Colin Granger. Uh, says Colin says many of the union meetings you were talking about took place outside the Conor Tavern. Outside that building was the famous iron lung circular urinal used by generations by generations of dockers. There were rumors that it, there were sorry I'm struggling a bit to read. There were rumors that it had been sold to Americans because it was a valuable valuable listed building we're talking about a urinal I'm, I'm really it's fascinating but i discover from the mayor of london's office three years ago that it had been cleaned and restored and was in a storage in the royal docks what chance do the panel think it could be brought back out and displayed <laughs> yes well, just what we need a, a, a urinal there um, the um, I, I I have read I have read about the urinals this uh, uh, iron lung and I I I was told that the um, that the smell was atrocious. <laughs> I I do, I do actually remember that that uh, the iron lung when it was still in place, and there were as you say there were all kinds of rumours about what was where it had gone and what happened to it it is it was in sections waiting to be cleaned so i'm glad to hear it has been cleaned unfortunately the london borough of newham hasn't got a really fantastic record on um displaying its heritage it has got an amazing history this this borough and it is a real shame that we don't have a proper museum or place heritage center that that tells that story of Newham and its people. And the Iron Lung is one part of that story <laughs> as used by generations of dockers. And it would be great if it if it was put on display somewhere, but uh, I'm not that hopeful in the near future. And Colin is confirming that the smell was indeed atrocious. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we talk about the royal dogs. We also need to talk about the smells as much as the colors and the sounds. And uh, we have a comment from uh, David. Uh, I uh, thank you very much, David. Because I had I had asked David a comment, a question about his comment, and he is um, clarifying that yes, he meant that the pub he's talking about the Connor Tavern was exactly opposite the dog's gate. So let me show you all again the pub we're talking about, which is this, the Conor Tavern. And uh, David is uh, confirming that, yes, it was opposite the dog gate, which makes sense. Uh, that or, 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 or make, means that we are right when we are talking about there was there was this was possible a place where dockers would concentrate would gather was a meeting point for dockers uh, looking for work hoping to be picked up for work for the day. Let's have a look on another comment from the audience. We uh, we have Fiona saying, as a child. I guess as a child born circa 1905, my grandpa and brothers take 
on their father's barge to, took, I guess it meant took on their father's barge to London. They ferried dockers from one side of the dock to the other in barges when waiting for barge to be loaded up. The, um, does this, thank you very much, Fiona. Does this um, sound like a familiar thing, Peter, Stephen? Yes. Uh, yes, because you think of them, all those vessels being unloaded and all those vessels were serviced by lighters, that's to say the long barges, tug tugboats, and there were ships crisscrossing, uh, small boats, big boats, crisscrossing the, the, water, the water all the time. It was a, you look at any photograph of the docks, it's not just the big ships, it's those little boats plying backwards and forwards, ferrying uh, seafarers on back onto the ships, off the ships, um, sometimes goods being taken off the ships onto loaded onto barges and then transshipped down the river, so on and so on. There was constant movement in that docks. It was not a quiet place. I'd just like to say, Maria, um, can you hear me? I'd um, just like to say that uh, there, was, there was a sketch published, an image actually published in the Illustrated London News on 19th August 1911 and it showed, it showed um, BME seafarers unloading boxes or wooden boxes off a ship or a, of a P&O ship that had just arrived at the docks. Uh, it's interesting because uh, it was something that Stephen was mentioning about the various work, workers and workers and there's also something else worth mentioning is that there's also a, a docker's memorial uh, opposite, I think it's just opposite um, the Excel Centre Mm -hmm. um, probably near the Thames Barry Park is a Dockers memorial to memorial to the Dockers and the works that the work that Dockers done at, at the docks. That's, that's interesting because um, about what uh, Asif just said about the um, uh, BME um, Dockers, because uh, I've 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 often read kind of quite the opposite in in the sense that um, that uh, Dockers were a bit of a sort of closed family, um, very sort of white uh, working class um, a lot of Irish um, and um, you know so they they sort of didn't tend to let outsiders into their docking community so uh, it's interesting if there were there were in fact um, mm -hmm. other um, ethnic groups working in the docks at any time uh, I, I'd never heard that before so that's very interesting and I wanted to say thank you to Fiona for sending for, for sharing with us this beautiful uh, memory. Uh, Fiona, this comment helps to bring the history of the Royal Dogs to life. I, I was reading your comment and I could imagine uh, the scene and the barges going from one side to the other of the river. I do apologize. I'm, I'm struggling a bit today um, because of my hand, but also I have I should be wearing this. But these glasses are new, so if I wear them, actually everything is very uh, blurry, but if I don't wear them, I have to be like this, otherwise I'm struggling to read, but show must go on. Uh, I'm going to mute myself so I can let the... Yeah, as one of the pieces of evidence that BAME workers did work in the docks, I remember uh, when the docks closed suddenly in 1981, they weren't. It wasn't sealed off. They were. They were just. There was just workers in there one day, empty the next day. And I used to go and have a walk around there when I lived down there. And I can remember at both ends of the Royal Albert, there were two sets of toilets, and there were what they called Asiatic toilets at both ends of the Royal Docks. That's to say, squat toilets. And that that was to, that was for the BAME workers, the Malays, the Malays the Indians who worked in the docks, not just on the ships, they were working in the docks, so definitely. I think what Peter's thinking of is the, um, the much later in the history of the docks, the 1950s, 1960s, when they did, particularly the National Union of Dock Workers, did become a very closed shop. And um, that was a little bit different to earlier on when there were lots and lots of ethnic groups, Chinese, Malaysians, Singaporeans, Sri Lankans, working in all of the London docks, but, and particularly to help unload some of those exotic cargoes, spices, ivories, ivory, that kind of thing that was coming in from the Asian, uh, from the Indian subcontinent. They need a specialist handling and they often use BA, the BAM ME workers from those places to do that work.
And we've got a comment from Fiona saying that she's really enjoying this discussion. I, I'm really enjoying this evening talking to Peter and Stephen and Asif uh, as well. Um, David was uh, talking again about the iron lung outside the canal path, and he is agreeing with Colin Granger that yes, the smell was horrendous. Uh, I got some photos to show you this evening and keep to keep sharing stories and memories. Uh, I'm gonna I'm not gonna show you the photo of the war uh, yet because I'm gonna leave that for the end because that's nearly like a, 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 a story on its own and I'm not sure how much time we'll have today to talk about it but um, I wanted to show you this photo which uh, is a bit of like um, I was like, I felt a bit like winning a lottery ticket. Somebody, uh, somebody had shared this photo on um, on a Facebook group. We were not sure what it came from, and we managed to find the person who originally posted this photo on Flirk, Flirk, uh, the Flick. I don't know how to pronounce that. The name of that social network where you share photos. But I think it's thicker, thicker isn't it? Flicker, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And the longer story short is that this photo was taken, as you can see in the description, was taken in the Royal Docks in 1968 on the ship Ranginade. And it's a, it, the photo shows the real moment that a family was emigrating to New Zealand from London. The picture was taken by the father of the family, uh, Graham Bill Watson. You can see in the photo, Peter and Adrian, uh, two of the sons. And this picture is um, courtesy, courtesy of Gravel's daughter, Claire, who had posted the photo on Flirk. Peter, help me here. On Flickr. <laughs> on Flickr. <laughs> and, and I got in touch with Claire and she very, she very, very kindly said, of course you can use those photos. So one photo is her brothers uh, on the ship, on the Ranginate ship emigrating to New Zealand and the photo next to it is a photo taken from the ship of the the Royal Docks as they were departing London to emigrate to New Zealand and uh, well it's, it's a photo that takes tells a story on its own uh, you can see you can see and it's not it's realistic it's in color you can see how many other ships around uh, in the docks and you can see the big cranes uh and and also um when i think of the dogs of the dogs i mostly think of the dogs as a cargo port and so this photo was my excuse to ask uh the three of you perhaps more steven or peter uh were the dogs mostly cargo or was passengers uh and and um and liner ships also an important business uh of the of the royal dogs um, yes, of, of course. The, the bulk of what went through the docks was cargo, but but yes, there were. Um, I think probably from the beginning of the um, the Royal Albert, I guess that there were there were passengers, um, and the the famous um, shipping line that uh, that carried passengers from uh, uh, from the Royal Albert um, was the um, was P and O, um, and uh, and as as was mentioned earlier, that uh, Galleons Hotel was. Uh, somewhere where people would stay the night, uh, would arrive, stay the night before boarding their their P and O ship, um, and I believe there was even a sort of a tunnel uh, from the hotel to the uh, to the uh, where they they embarked on the on the ship, um, and I, I think also um, in the past a lot of the even the cargo ships would have accommodation on board for passengers, yeah. so. It, that it wasn't just a, a straight split between um, cargo ships and passenger ships. I think you know, um, cargo ships would also uh, be able to accommodate uh, passengers uh, to make a bit of extra money and uh, and so on. Yeah. Yes. Uh, am I unmuted now? Yes. Um, yeah, looking at once again at the docks as a human landscape, you know, you think of those hard working conditions, hard living conditions. It's only natural that young people growing up from the 1880s right through to the 1960s, looking at those ships disappearing off to the far corners of the world, exotic names like Valparaiso, you know, Buenos Aires, you know, they were, they were exciting and exotic. And 
it, there was lots of ways of, es of escaping from the harsh conditions that the docks get, gave working people's lives. You know, escapes like sport, music hall, cinema. But the ultimate escape was to get on one of those ships and go go and live somewhere else. You know, people were bombarded with uh, information about the wide open spaces of Canada, the great farms of Australia, and so on and so on. And the, the opportunities seemed boundless. And it was, you know, I've done lots of oral history interviews with people who, uh, <clears throat> and written interviews with people who, who nowadays we think, oh, sending a 14 year old boy off to Australia to, 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 for a new life, that's a terrible thing. But in 1935, a 14 year old was considered an adult and it was the ultimate opportunity to go to a new country, a new land and create a new life for themselves, start a new family and get out of that poverty that was grinding everybody down. You know, it was a it was an adventure and thousands and thousands of local kids looked to those ships, looked to those ships as a place of escape to something, to a better life. And, and those countries, you know, Australia, New Zealand, Canada especially, uh, were welcoming those people. Uh, they needed they needed workers um, to expand their economy and to, to feed the, their own citizens and to uh, grow the crops to export to, to other countries. So uh, there were incentives, you know, you, you would actually get paid some money to, to emigrate to those countries. I see very quickly, I, I'm going to have time, and that's my fault because I enjoy talking to the three of you so much that I have asked a lot of questions. You wanted me to share this short or this illustration also tonight. What would you like to talk about this? Uh, that's what about I've, uh, sorry, um, that's what I've already <laughs> spoken about this sketch before. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a sketch in 1892 of the 6th of August showing, it was showing the uh, South Asian seafarers celebrating the festival of Muharram, which was the, uh, the martyrdom of Imam Hussein and Hassan, the grandson of Prophet Muhammad. And it shows this, this sketch was drawn of them carrying uh, various artifacts celebrating the festival at the Royal Albert and Royal Victoria Dock in Newham. So it's interesting. I just want to just mention that, Sprite, that's it. In, in fact, you can see the silhouette of the tall ships in the illustration. You look at the at the right upper corner. You can see the the, the, the silhouette of the ships. It is. Thank you very much for sending this. I see this really, really, really beautiful. Um, I've got a photo, or a couple of photos that um are very beautiful. Are very at the same time very very sad. There's something kind of like eerie, magical, but magical, but in a kind of like ghostly, uh, like in a dream. Uh, sense of it, like to see a place so big that used to be so full of life, suddenly so empty. I'm really, really thankful to, uh, grateful to Brian Cook who has allowed me to share these photos tonight. These photos were taken by the late Alfred G. Jones in 1982, the 1st of January. So the first day of the first month after the year that the docks closed. Uh, uh, there's something very powerful, very poetic about uh, these photos in relation to when these photos were, were taken. Uh, uh, I know we're running out of time, but I'm going to ask uh, Stephen and Peter to explain to us uh, as brief as possible, why did this happen? Why did the Royal Docks that used to be the port the heart of the Port of London, the biggest, busiest, uh, more successful system of dogs uh, in the world. Why did they have to close? And I'm going to unmute both of you. Over to Peter, I think. Well, okay. So um, after the war, um, in the in the sort of the 1950s and early 1960s, the the, the royal docks were booming. Um, it was they were reaching record levels of trade. Um, but uh, and in fact, the, uh, there was a lot of damage during the war itself. And uh, so the, the Port of London Authority, who were running the docks uh, at that time, they were um, they did a lot of modernization. They brought in new uh, ways of uh, uh, cargo handling, such as forklift trucks and, and new warehouses and all those things. Um, so everything was going very well. Um, but um, but then 
in other countries they started to to uh, in fact actually it was really the the american army uh, the American services that introduced new methods during the war of, of handling cargo. Uh, so one of those, for example, was, was what's called row row or roll on, roll off. Um, and, and that's where um, a truck would go to a, a, a factory or a warehouse or something like that would be loaded up. Um, and uh, the, tr the, the goods will be put on the trailer. A, a tra the, the truck itself would, would carry the, the would pull the, the, uh, uh, the, the trailer to, uh, to the docks. Um, the trailer will go onto the ship. Um, and um, uh, leaving the the actual lorry itself, the uh, that pulled it, um, and the 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 the, um, the the trailer with all the goods on board would go off to another port somewhere, where another lorry would come along and connect to it and, and take it away. And that uh, meant that cargo hand was much um, much more productive, uh, much more efficient. Um, the key thing is, it didn't need any dockers, um, and but what it needed was um, a a dock with uh, it didn't need uh, any cranes even um no dockers um it would um but it needed a big sort of lorry park so for the for the trucks to to uh, to park in um and certainly the um docks in the upper thames the uh, the upper uh, port of london uh, the uh, um, st catherine's and the, the west india and the london and the east india they couldn't handle that at all um they they were you know small places with uh, they, uh, and didn't have you couldn't have big, these, these big car parks and, and so on so um, the, the the royal docks could to some extent do that but but the the place that was really best for that was actually down at Tilbury where they had plenty of they still had plenty of space surrounding them and the next thing that happened was that um, in um, I think it's about 1964 um, so, something like that um, the U S Canada and Denmark um, agreed on a standardization of container. So that meant that same thing could happen as with the, the, the row row, uh, where um, a container could be left at a factory or a warehouse, could be loaded up as the factory needed to, to do it, uh, then uh, it could be then, then put on by crane onto the back of a, uh, a trailer um, and um, carted off to the, the docks. Um, and then a, 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 um, a um, a crane would lift that into the ship itself, um, and uh, what, what, and it was important to have a standard size to do all those things, and and, and also to be put on the so to be put on the back of a, a, a lorry or to be put on the back of a um, or, or a train that needs to be a standard size, and that changed everything, um, and um, so um, the, the the PLA uh, actually the general manager of the PLA was actually in in New York at one point. And he saw this happening and, and set, see, saw how the the, um, the docks in, in the States had suddenly changed to this new system of working. Um, and he telegraphed, telegra sent a telegram back to, to London saying, stop everything. Uh, we've got to change it, all the docks and and, uh, uh, and, and going in a new direction. And um, uh, But then they, they thought about this and then realized that really the only dock that could handle all this, this containerization was Tilbury. And that was really the death knell for all the the other docks, um, and everything changed pretty quickly. Um, so, um, so the first container ships were coming in in the uh, I think the late 60s probably, um, and um, and then by the uh, by the 70s the docks were closing down, um, apart from Tilbury, and um, and then the the, the Royal Docks uh, closed in in 1981. So it was amazing how very quickly over just a decade or so. Uh, these docks that lasted for hundreds, a couple of hundred years, suddenly were closed. Yeah, uh, I, I think to be fair, the dockers saw that coming themselves. They knew what was on the cards. I remember speaking to the <clears throat> stevedore's shop steward, Mickey Fenn, back in the 1970s, and he, he said that these docks are all going to be gone in a few years containerizations made that inevitable. But I think we should pause and just think of the human effect of that closure. You know, it wasn't just the dockers and the stevedores that went, were thrown out of work. It was all those hundreds, if not thousands of small businesses around, um, around the Docklands area that suffered when those docks closed. You know, the, the cafes, the pubs, the ships chandlers, the truck drivers, you know, there were just the, the area was just devastated by the loss, like the mining communities were in the 80s in, in the north of England. 
by those closures you know it was and it had a ter ter terrible effect that still that's only just now beginning to be resolved by new developments it left a great big gap in um, the economic and social fabric of east london that wasn't solved for decades yeah that's right i mean i remember you know growing up when i was i was fairly young at that stage but um you know um i would spend some time in the, the east end uh, for fa family reasons or um I, I used to get jobs on uh, delivering to uh food to cafes for example on um and going around the, the east end in that time um was it was a very sad place you know it was you could tell it was dying um uh, pubs you know empty pubs and that sort of thing and uh, um yeah so it had a big effect on the whole, whole of the east end all of east london i i i would like to add that i think something that we might all agree is that it was nobody's fault that the docks had to close it was technology it was no way that we people at the time could have avoided that but I think there's a, a big agreement in the fact that in in the theory that it had to happen, but perhaps it could have managed in a different way to make sure that there was something there for those communities that were losing everything because it's like a domino effect, as Stephen said. You close the docks, then there's no point for the factories to be around there. There will be no need for the pubs and the shops and the and the bank branch and the bank branches in those places so it's like it's going to collapse those communities and perhaps something else something better something better plan could have been put in place so that it wouldn't take 20 30 years for those areas to to regenerate and and i and i don't want to talk in a lot of detail about it because i have such a huge respect for part of the history that i don't know much which is what happened between the 1980s to now which i mean i think peter and Stephen could write another book about the regeneration of the dogs and you would you would need like 200 pages just to explain what has happened in the last 20 to 30 years in the in, in the dogs but i think that we can agree that it had to happen it could have happened in a different way to support better those communities i'm going to uh, go back to some of the comments from the audience we were talking about the port of london or the royal docks also being a port for passengers not all passengers and liner ships not only for cargo and denise thank you very much denise says yes uh, my paternal grandmother grew up in Wanstead and was one of about nine children i think several of her sisters several of her sisters were sent off to australia to be domestic servants. Thank you very much for sharing that story with us. Um, and Matthew says, Matthew says, so interesting. Thanks to all of the panel for the informative evening. Thank you very much for watching and tuning in live and your comments, Matthew. Would love to hear more about the BAME seamen, maybe next time. Well, that's why we are all very happy that we had a sieve here tonight, because otherwise we would have been missing a very important part of the history of the Royal Dogs, which is the, the amazing huge contribution of the BAME community seamen seafarers to the history of the royal dogs and in fact with my last picture I will also have a specific question about this for Asif uh, so uh, very very quickly because I know we're running very very late but uh, I got two questions um, one is for Stephen and my question for Stephen, let me make Matthew comments disappear. My question for Stephen is very, very quickly. I, When I started the show, I said I was paying a tribute to the East End spirit saying, despite my hand and, and actually my hand and my eyes today, I'm going to keep calm, carry on and hope for the best. Uh, the keep calm, carry on has been long associated with the Eastern and in particular the, the docks area because it was an absolute miracle that the Royal Docks, the, the Eastern, the docks in particular, but the Royal Docks were very, very, very badly, heavily bombed during the war yet never stopped working um can steven explain to me what sounds to me like a miracle uh well 
I think you can explain the blitz spirit by referring back to what I've already mentioned, the, the spirit of the, the docks and the East End that had already grown up around the very tight sisterhood of women living in those tough conditions, making sure that the men who went off to work every day were fed, that the children were clothed and brought up in as best as, as they could. You know, those, those families were already having it tough. They went through the depression, they went through poverty, they went through deprivation, uh, and you know the Blitz was yet another layer. I had a real, I had a privilege back in 2012 to chair a panel of um, uh, an, an event for um, the Olympics, where we brought together a group of elderly ladies from North Woolwich with a group of schoolgirls from Sarah Bonnell School in Stratford. And the schoolgirls came on first and said how tough their life was, and there were fears of knives on the knives on the streets and muggings and gang culture and drugs and whatever. And then the old ladies came forward and <laughs> began speaking about the Blitz and the nightly bombings and their friends being killed and you know the policeman at the end of the road being blown up where he stood and the air raid shelters and the, the sleepless nights and the closed roads and the rubble and these girls just said respect <laughs> we thought we <laughs> we were the queens of the road but you ladies <laughs> just what you went through is absolutely unimaginable and that that was a bit spirit they went through it they got through it you know because there was no other choice you know, it was it was as you say, keep keep smiling, carry on, and they did. And it's just, we still owe them an enormous debt of gratitude and thanks. But how was it possible that during the night the, the dogs were would be very very badly bombed and fire everywhere, and yet in the morning they were still working and operating, so that food could continue arriving to England, so that yes. Uh, because because they were the the, the 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 gateway to the to, to the United Kingdom at at the moment where we were fighting a, a, an international war, so we needed the dogs to continue operating so things could come in and come out. But how did they manage to, to keep them open and running if they were heavily bombed for, I think September to April or May, non-stop? Yeah, it, it, it was indeed a miracle. I mean, it's uh, it is incredible to think about it these days. Um, I mean, and you don't think you know just. One just one aspect of it is that um, um, the uh, there was a blackout, so um, uh, the the dockers had to work completely in the dark. Um, so they, they they were you know bringing ships through locks. Um, there were tugs going all over the place um, in complete darkness um, because they couldn't have any lights on. Um, that this is one aspect of of the miracle that that happened really. And uh, I said that. Uh, I had a particular question for Asif talking about the the war and, and not only the first, the Second World War but also the First World War and it's Asif, how little do we know about the huge valuable contribution of BAME seamen and soldiers in the British Navy during the two wars? We know we know nearly nothing, do we? Uh, I think very little is known. Um, I I'd like to mention here. Dr. Rosina Vizram, she wrote a book called Agents in Britain, 400 Years of History. And she mentions something like a figure of 50,000 uh, BME seamen served in the First World War on British vessels that sailed out of India and various other places um, on, on the vessels of PO and, and, and British India Steam Navigation Company. So it's quite a huge figure. But something like only 2,000 or so war medals were issued to Indian seafarers. So it's quite a different contrast in the, in the figures that served and the amount of medals that were given out. But obviously the criteria for, for, for qualifying for those medals would have been different. So I mean, it's quite a huge figure for the First, first, first World War. It's not known. But um, I mean, you find many other seafarers, such as uh, you know, Arab seafarers from Yemen, as well as Aden. Um, I know one particular, particular case of uh, a, Ye a Yemeni seafarer from Aden who's, who, who, who actually lived in, in, in the UK in South Shields by the name of Hassan Ali. And he served in the war, and it's not very, very not not a lot is known about these seamen. Thank you very much, and uh, I I would like to I have to bring this to 
the end. I want to thank first everybody watching tonight, uh, also for your patience. It's been a bit of a um, a bit more difficult for me than uh, in previous occasions. I was struggling both with my hands, so I wasn't very quick. I wasn't very quick today muting and unmuting people. Thank you for watching. Thank you for all your comments and your questions. But thank you for Stephen and Peter for sharing your huge knowledge of I don't know how many acres of knowledge um of royal dogs history is in your brain and how much you have shared with us uh is i mean it's, it's a gift to talk to both of you and thank you asif because i think every time we talk and i have had the, i've been very lucky that i think this is the third time i either interview you or we are in the same event um I only know that I know nothing is what I think when I talk to you. Like there's so much about the BAME seafarers and seamen that we don't know. And uh, and and if we are not talking about the stories, we're missing a huge, very important part of the history of, Lon of the Port of London and the history of Britain. Uh, so thank you very much to the three of you. I hope you all enjoyed our discussion. I really, really enjoyed talking to all of you. And um, because I love music and why not, I'm going to play again the music video with which we started the show this evening. Thank you very much and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you.